Amen. We uh, end the Lord's uh, prayer uh, speaking to the glory of God. And we see His glory manifest in this story, very familiar to us, the Christmas story. We see the most, uh, the most detailed story we have in Scripture about Jesus' coming to earth, the wonderful gift of the Incarnation. And I'm going to pick up where we left off last week in verse 6 of chapter 2. And, and read through the end of the chapter. And hear, hear the Word of God. Hear it afresh and anew today. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom His favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which was just as they had been told. Let us bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank You for Your Son, Jesus. And we thank You for pointing the way, for showing us a sign in a marvelous way, really to describe who You are, that we might again come to know You, Not only as God, a Heavenly Father, but as a Savior who lives in us. And I pray, come Holy Spirit now, as we share in this message, your message, your story, that is part of our story and is our story, through Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. In 1971, there was a a band named the Five Man Electrical Band. I'm going to age tell you my age a little by quoting a few of these uh, words of this song. See if you remember it. It was a song called Signs. Sign, sign, everywhere a sign. Blocking out the scenery, breaking my mind. Yeah, go ahead if you know the word, say it with me. I won't hold it against you. Don't do this. Don't do that. Can't you read the sign? And then one of the chorus or the, or the verse part says this, Now, hey, you, mister, can't you read? You've got to have a shirt and a tie to get a seat. You can't even watch. No, you can't eat. You ain't supposed to be here. The sign said you had to have a membership card to get inside. And then he says, ugh, in the midst of that song. This song is essentially about all the ways people are kept out of places. If you're not part of a certain segment of society, Basically rich if you listen to that song or clean cut. In fact, he's worried about will his long hair keep him from getting a job. Or if you're the right stereotype, you're going to be cut out. There was a group of folks in the time of Jesus that became the keepers. Later we're going to talk about an innkeeper. But the keepers of religious things. Those were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They did so much to restrict people from coming in a true relationship with Christ. They thought if you're going to be religious, you've got to do this, not do that. If you can outweigh the bad, you might just possibly make it. But the restrictions they added to God's law, which is true and is right, were restrictive signs for people to really understand what good news will be. Now, throughout the Bible, there's lots of signs. In fact, the Gospel writers mention signs. Good signs, wonderful signs. 
The Gospel writer John, the beloved disciple who, who was so close to Jesus, when he writes his Gospel, he forms it around seven miraculous signs. And each of those signs were shown to us, whether it was some type of healing or raising Lazarus from the dead, they were shown to us so we can see who Jesus Christ really is. That was the point of the sign. And what's interesting in John's Gospel is the very first miracle that you see was being at a wedding and changing water to wine, which we think of kind of as a strange kind of miracle. But the, the thing about that was that Jesus, when the folks had run out of wine there, He took six ceremonial hand-washing religious things, put water in them, and made wine, pointing to the best that He was the new wine, the best. And in that story, He was saying that I'm not about religion, I'm about relationship. And I'm the new wine. And all of the other miraculous signs shown by John point to us who Jesus Christ is. These are really good signs. Well, in the infancy narratives in just two chapters of Luke's Gospel, Luke shows us three signs. Now, two of these we have talked about. Today we're going to talk about the third. But just for a reminder, the first sign was shown to the old priest, Zechariah, who he and his wife had been praying for a child. She was barren and humiliated, disgraced, if you want to say it that way. Couldn't have a child, was past childbearing age, and yet they had prayed. And when they hear word that she's going to be with child, that being John the Baptist. Remember, Zechariah, the religious priest, by the way, who was a good guy, it says, by Scripture, but he was part of the religious culture there. He doubted what God can do in that. And what was the sign? Y'all tell me what sign was given. Yeah, he couldn't talk. What a sign to get. I can't talk for nine months. And that was so God could say, Zechariah, it doesn't matter about your doubts. The plan I have for this world, it will happen. And I will carry it out even in the midst of your doubts. So you're going to have this sign. And boy, did he understand that sign. For nine months, I couldn't imagine. Y'all couldn't imagine. I could be quiet for nine months, could you? Maybe for nine minutes or nine seconds. Some, right? But wow. But it was again, you just watch. And Zechariah, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to trust me. The Advent candle is on trust. You're going to have to trust me with this plan. Well, the second sign we see in Luke's Gospel was the one given to Mary. What a wonderful story of a young teen, probably a young teen girl, who hears that she will give birth to the Messiah, the Savior, by way of the Holy Spirit. And it's an incredible thing. I, I, I don't know how she just wasn't blown away with this whole thing and knowledge. And yet in trust, she reaches out. And then God gives her a sign. And the sign she was given was that, remember Elizabeth, your family member? the one who was said to be barren and past childbearing ages, guess what? She's six months pregnant now. And this is the sign that I will keep my promise with you, Mary. Another sign given. She gets to go see Elizabeth, and when she enters and greets Elizabeth, it says that the baby leaps in Elizabeth's womb because John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit, even before birth and the power of that. So these were powerful, powerful signs that were given. Well, the third sign, now those two were both pointing to future things, not too far in the future, but the sign given here was a sign that was going to point to the very present of who God is. And the third sign is that the birth of Jesus Christ. And it reveals to us the depth of the character of God and of Jesus and just how much God loves us and how much and how badly God wants to be in a relationship with us. Not about religion, but about relationship again. Now we know that Mary and Joseph had a long and difficult journey to Bethlehem. By the language, it is uncertain how long they had been there. A lot of times we think they just showed up that night, but it just simply says while they were there. They could have been there a week. We don't know. They could have been there two weeks and still struggling, by the way, to find a place. But at this point, the Scripture is simple. It just says she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in cloths and she placed him in a manger. And you all know the story. The manger was a place to feed the animals. We'll talk about that a little later. That's where Jesus would be born. 
What is emphasized though, and he didn't have to emphasize this, it would have been easy for the Scriptures to have stopped, placed him in a manger, but it goes on to say, because there was no room, where? In the end. There was no room. Now there's a point that that was spoken in Scripture. And so whenever they arrived, at some point, Joseph and Mary, whether they went to some relatives, to their house, and by the way, the word for in is cataluma. It's a powerful word. It means guest room, upper room. Bethlehem probably didn't have a lot of what we think of or hotels today. They more had places you would go to, to your family, and some had bigger places, and there were some kind of traveling places as well. But the cataluma, that room shows up again in Scripture when Jesus meets with His disciples in the upper room for Holy Communion or serving the Passover before it says powerful implications. But wherever they show up and how many different places they show up, when they knock on the door, whether it's an innkeeper or not, it doesn't ever say there's an innkeeper, but somebody had to answer the door. And I would imagine when Joseph and Mary were just asking for a place to be, whoever answered might have pointed to a sign and it said, no vacancy, no room. Can't you see, Joseph? Can you see the sign that there is no room? Now, a lot of times the innkeeper in the plays gets a real bad image. And I heard a writer, or saw a writer wrote this, the innkeeper was not a bad man. He was just a busy man. And sometimes the sign that we give to Jesus is simply the busyness of life. Or simply the ignorance that we didn't know. I think of all the people that would have been staying there where they were trying to get into. Maybe just for a place for Mary to, to lay her head. And, and I, they were all probably asleep. If they came late at night, they were probably asleep. It's a wonderful song out that Christ came in this world while Bethlehem was sleeping. And a lot of people didn't notice. And a lot of people didn't see the sign that's shown here in Luke chapter 2 for a lot of different reasons. I often thought if someone, of just another man and woman who were in the, the place they were trying to get into, saw the sign the person who answered the door missed was that Mary was nine months pregnant. That would have been pretty noticeable. And I'm surprised someone just didn't say, hey, I'll go sleep outside while they come in here. But that's not what happened. See, in all that, in all that busyness, not necessarily bad, but just don't see the sign of who Jesus is as He comes. Bruce Larson tells this wonderful story. It's a time he's going to Atlanta for a convention. His wife's with him. Other people he knows are at the same hotel. And he made reservations at the hotel. He comes up and they said, sorry, we're booked. There's no more rooms. And he's like, no, there must be a problem here. I've made reservations. And the guy insists, sorry, we're booked. There's no more room. This conversation goes on quite a while until one of his friends has now overheard part of the conversation and walks up to the desk and says, hey, by the way, I work for so-and-so corporation, large corporation, probably stayed there at that hotel lot, and he said, I would like you to find a room for my friend. And Bruce Larson said, and amazingly, a room showed up. <laughs> and I got a place. And But this is what my friend said. Uh, it's all about who you know. you got to know the right people. And what he did was he used privilege, if we want to say that, to find a place for Bruce and his wife that night. And the reason I tell that story is God actually puts aside privilege. Mary and Joseph don't take advantage. In some ways, they don't know the right people. And instead, the Savior of the world will be born outside with the animals. Um, it will remind us when the signs point to Jesus. Remember the Scripture? The Son of Man has no place to lay His head. In His journey of three years of ministry, Jesus was from here to there to here to there. He did not become too attached to this world other than His love for us. And He was on, he was on the go in that kind of ministry. And it, it just points out who He is. But God was not going to take the privileged place. In fact, Jesus is born in the most humble of places. Probably a lower room of that house that has the cataluma. Oftentimes, the animals stay below. 
but probably more than likely it is stated that they went into a cave. Now, if you look at Bethlehem, Bethlehem is 2,700 feet above sea level. And when you look at it, it looks like it's built kind of on a mound. And, and beyond, that, as that mound goes down, there's all kinds of caves. Well, those caves were used for animals. Not a better place than in the heat to have an animal go into a cave to cool off and so forth. So oftentimes, the animals were in caves. And that's where Mary and Joseph would go. Most kings of the time of Jesus would have been birthed in the finest of palaces. In fact, if you're in the Holy Land or look on the pictures, when you're in Bethlehem, you can look just uh, not, not far away in one of, one of Herod's palaces. He had at least three in Israel. One of those, you can see it's called the Herodium. And you can see it right from where that birthing place would have been for Jesus Christ. Well, Herod and other kings were born in such places like that, but not Jesus Christ. If anything, Jesus put aside privilege to be here with us. Jesus was born in a place that smelled of animals, that was dirty and filthy. A place where He'd be put in a feeding trough for animals. I'm trying to think of uh, if 40 or 50 animals had eaten out of that trough. <laughs> Not exactly the cleanest of places either. But it's a deep sign of God's love for us. First, that Jesus would come as a tiny baby, risking being raised by a young girl and by Joseph. But second, that God has come to live among us in the dirt, in the filthiness, uh, long before we knew God, where we lived. That's where He came to live. And that's part of the sign in which we see. Max Licato, one of my favorite writers, in fact, when John pulled out the Max Licato book last night uh, at, the, at the Christmas party for the inspiration class, I thought, man, he's going to preach this sermon. And uh, he only took about four or five minutes, though. But he quoted Max Licato. And I'd already had this Max Licato prayer here. Listen, it's called Mary's Prayer in his book, When God Came Near. God, O oh infant God, heaven's fairest child, Conceived by the union of divine grace with our disgrace. Sleep well. Sleep well. Bask in the coolness of this night bright with diamonds. Sleep well for the heat of anger simmers nearby as she speaks to Jesus. Enjoy the silence of the crib for the noise of confusion rumbles in your future. Savor the sweet safety of my arms for a day is soon coming when I cannot protect you. Rest well, tiny hands. For although you belong to a king, you will touch no satin, own no gold. You will grasp no pen, guide no brush. No, your tiny hands are reserved for works more precious. To touch a leper's wound. To wipe a widow's weary tear. To claw the ground of Gethsemane. Your hands, so tiny, so tender, so white, clutch tonight in an infant's fist. They aren't destined to hold a scepter nor wave from a palace balcony. They are reserved for a Roman spike that will staple them to a Roman cross. And this would be the good news that an angel of the Lord would share with the most unlikely of folks to show a sign to. It was not to the Pharisees. It was not to the priest. It was not in Jerusalem. It was not to Herod or to Caesar. But it was to what we call lowly shepherds, and we sing about them. And the truth of the fact was, they pretty much were. Shepherds in the time of Jesus Christ usually were small land owners. And, and the biblical archaeologists and others say they probably didn't have enough land to support their family, both with the food they needed and also to pay the taxes for things like Caesar was collecting as well. They would hire themselves out. They were often many hours in shepherding their in Bethlehem and other places as well. It was a dirty job. And often, because it was a dirty job, they would become unceremonially clean. And they were refused worship because of that. Sign, sign. Everywhere a sign. These were the signs that kept people out. And that was one of those. Remember, the lepers had to say, unclean, unclean. Dr. Jim Fleming, who's the biblical archaeologist, have studied under, he taught in Jerusalem. He was on a bus with his students one day 
And they were going uh, through the wilderness of Judea, and they saw a shepherd walking with a crippled sheep, or an injured sheep. And so Jim Fleming said he asked the group, would it be okay if we gave the shepherd a ride? They enthusiastically said yes. And then he got on the bus. He probably hadn't showered, Fleming said, in the last month. There were literally flies flying around him. There was sheep dung all over him. And those students who had so enthusiastically said yes were now praying, I hope he doesn't sit next to me. You know how you're, you just want your own seat in a bus and you slide over just enough that yeah, not quite enough room for someone else to get there. Fleming goes on to say, we have to get it out of our heads, the romantic Christmas card that has the pristine shepherds. They were far from pristine. In fact, they kind of are symbolic of us. and Who we are without Jesus Christ. That's why Christ has come. That's why God has come to be with us. He came near to live in our mess, in our neighborhood. And it says to these, this group, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Now folks, glory happened over the mercy seat in the temple. Glory of God came in the tabernacle as they made sacrifices and worshipped God at different times. But now glory has come to a dirty shepherd's field. That's where it's come, and that's highly symbolic to us. Glory has come into our lives because of the light of Jesus Christ. And they're terrified. Someone was saying the other day when we talked about the angel that visited Zechariah, every time an angel showed up, people were afraid. But they always calm the people. And the angel said, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all. All the people. You shepherds, I know you've been left out a lot. But the first to hear the news, to hear it's for all people, we're shepherds. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born for you. He is Christ the Lord. Now we've got to catch this. If the angel from heaven gives us the description of who Jesus is, and by the way, they don't hear that His name's Jesus because Joseph is going to name Him Jesus. Kind of like we give names at the hospital. But the first name that is given Jesus is the name what? Savior. And that means deliverer, rescuer. From what? From our sin. He's come to deliver us from our sin. And if the angel from heaven comes and said, the first thing I want you to know about Jesus is that He saves, that's the central thing that we have. We can't bypass that. That's the good news. If we don't start with Jesus, we're not going to grow with Jesus. And so He's called Savior. And then He's called Messiah. And Messiah means anointed one, the one you've been waiting for, the one of God's plan to save the world. And then, here's a really neat name, He's called Lord. And guess who used to, who was called Lord in the Old Testament? It was God. And so, here is God. God come near. God come near in the Incarnation of the baby of Jesus Christ. And then he says those famous words, the angel, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And you've heard me say this before, but it's the essential thing of Luke's Gospel when he talks about sign. That was the sign of assurance. If the shepherds were to go, this is what you'll find. Is to know that truth is being spoken that you can trust in. This will be your sign. The only other time that is used in Scripture and Luke's Gospel is the time at Jesus' death when He's died on the cross and Joseph of Arimathea asks for the body of Jesus Christ so he can bury Him. But it says He takes Him down very lovingly and He wraps Him in linens the same way that Mary would wrap Jesus at His birth in a cave placed in a manger. Joseph of Arimathea like to place Him somewhat in a cave. It was a new grave, never been used, in the side of a hill basically. Cut out rock to place the body of Jesus Christ. This is the sign. 
The sign is far beyond the fact that just Jesus is here. But Jesus has come for a reason and for a purpose. And He's not come here so that we can do a lot of religious things. He's come here so we can have a relationship with Him, a deep abiding one. And it says that the shepherds, you know, if you think about it, what if the shepherds had decided maybe out of fear, what if they didn't go? They would have missed the sign <laughs> if they didn't go. But it says that the shepherds, as they talked to one another, said these words after they saw, by the way, the glory of the heavenly host come and sing praise to God. By the way, anytime glory comes, there's usually praise and singing, by the way. So folks, get used to it when we're in heaven. It's going to be a lot of praise and singing. And the shepherds said, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. We've heard about it, but now we're going to go see. And it says they find Mary and Joseph and the baby, just as it was said, was lying in the manger. And they saw that it was true. They saw everything, not only that we see, but what we've been told is the truth. And they will glorify and praise God at seeing truth. That seeing the fact that God loves us so much, He's here as a baby. He's here for us. And it says that they will go and share the good news with other people. I want to read and close with a testimony that a lady shared several years ago. Her name is Mary Ellen Rothrock. Um, and uh, she shared this actually in an article several years back. The article was called The Lyric That Saved My Life. And I'm just going to read you her testimony from this. She was a student at the University of Wisconsin, by the way, and then she became a grad student while she was there. And this is what she says. Des despair seemed to permeate the student body, especially those in the humanities classes. A fellow graduate student summed it up quite cynically. Playwright Samuel Beckert is right. Man is just a piece of trash in a universe that's running down. I mean, that's the kind of stuff she was hearing. In college, atheism became my religion. Yet when I got into grad school, I found myself seeking to fill a spiritual void in my life. I began practicing transcendental meditation, or TM. I met periodically with a TM supervisor. After a year or so of meditating, I mentioned that I had a recurring thought when I was told to concentrate on my mantra. Now we know that TM is not of Christ and those things, but... This is the way she was trying to find something to fill her life. And they were supposed to have some kind of mantra you repeat. And guess what kept coming back to her? It was a line from Handel's Messiah. Something in my mind keeps repeating, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. To my young mind, not only was the music thrilling, but the words seemed to come from beyond this world. I love the joyful language. Hallelujah. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. For unto us a child is born, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. She would say that song over and over again from the Messiah. She told her TM supervisor about this, and you know what the TM supervisor said? Hold on, let me show you another sign. Forget those words. Just forget them. And then she said, I begin to think, these aren't just random thoughts. It suddenly hit me that the phrase, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, was an invitation from a personal God of glory for me to seek Him. Why couldn't He be wonderful and counselor and mighty God and everlasting Father and Prince of Peace? Now, hear this. Within months, Mary met a woman who explained how she could come into a relationship with Jesus Christ who was pointing her a good sign, a sign that we see in Bethlehem. She said, as I heard the words from the Bible, the words from the musical score I'd been repeating over and over suddenly made sense. The Holy Spirit convinced me of the truth. The God I'd hungered for, the personal God, loved me. Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent, omnipotent reigneth. She said over and over again, and she became a Christian. In that day and time. He's been a faithful Christian for Christ. You know what? Christ comes to us in a lot of ways. And she heard a sign, and then she saw the sign of who this baby born in Bethlehem is. The one Mary would wrap with cloths 
and place in a manger so that not only could Mary, that Mary I just spoke of, could see truth and come to know truth in the same way that we can as well. He is born this day. He is born for you. Personalize that message. In Jesus' name, Amen.